is a story that really begins here. Standing in the middle of this photo, with her message held high, is my mum. And to her left is an awkward, scraggly mop of hair that is unfortunately me. We are standing at a rally for action on climate change in the run-up to the 15th UN Climate Conference. Now, despite everything that my mum taught me, by the time that I had arrived at university, I had successfully pushed the threat of climate change to the back of my mind. It can be such an overwhelming problem that I had taken the fail-safe approach of putting my head firmly in the sand. In other words, I had put it somewhere near the bottom of my very long list of things that I would eventually get around to addressing. And so it wasn't until I sat in one of my first university classes that that all came rushing back. The assignment that we had been given was to design a structure that would help protect the city from rising sea levels. And it completely freaked me out. It became this really sobering moment. I suddenly remembered standing at this rally. In fact, I realized that six years had passed and we were still facing the same problem. I suddenly wondered if we were a generation who were going to spend their careers trying to remedy the environmental disasters that we humans were responsible for creating. And so this experience, coupled with the articles that we were being given to read by environmentalists such as Bill McKibben and theorists such as Jeremy Rifkin, became this sort of catalyst that kicked me into action. I became hungry to understand what was causing our climate to change. But more importantly, what I really wanted to know is what can we, as individuals, do to have a positive impact on the problem. And so I did what we all do when we have a burning question that we desperately want the answer to. I googled it. And one of the first links that came up was to Vice President Al Gore's climate leadership camps. It was this weekend-long retreat to be held in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And the goal, according to the website, was to give participants an in-depth understanding of the problem and to equip them with the tools they needed to be a leader within their community. And so without a second thought, I signed up and I booked my plane ticket. What I saw and what I learned during that short weekend blew me away. I met attendees who were as young as 12, who'd persuaded their parents and their teachers to take them. I learned about Chatez Cat Martinez, the 17-year-old environmentalist from Colorado, who is currently suing the US federal government, along with 21 other plaintiffs, for violating their right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness. He spoke at the UN in 2015, and he is the youth director of his organization, Earth Guardians. I learned about Boyan Slap, the 21-year-old environmentalist and inventor whose design for a system of cleaning plastic waste from the oceans has already raised more than $2 million in support for his organization, The Ocean Cleanup. And I learned about Isabel and Milati Widson, the 15- and 13-year-old sisters who are campaigning and successfully changing policy to ban the use of plastic bags on their island of Bali in Indonesia. And so it's fair to say that I left that weekend with this newfound sense of optimism, because what I saw was a generation who were keen to learn as much as they could about the environmental threats that we face a generation who were eager to educate others and to inspire action on a bigger scale than we've seen before. But most importantly, I left that weekend with an answer to that question that I've been asking. What can we do as individuals to have a positive impact on our changing climate? And the answer breaks down into three really simple actions. The first one is that we must educate both ourselves and those around us, on the reality of the situation. We must engage with the science and look at the evidence of the changes that are occurring. 
When I got back from that short weekend, I wanted to shout about what I had learned from a mountaintop, but I didn't have a mountain. So instead, I reached out to my brother, Jack. He is a filmmaker and a photographer, and before I had arrived at university, we had spent four years traveling and making films for a popular online blog called Jazz Gap. We decided together that we would make a film that documented the very real effects that climate change is having on our planet today. And so, very ambitiously, we typed out an email to the World Wildlife Fund. And to our amazement, they gave us the opportunity to join them on a scientific research trip traveling to Greenland. We would be there to witness and to record the increasingly rapid decline of Greenland's ice sheet and surrounding sea ice. We helped download time-lapse data of one of the world's fastest retreating glaciers. These two cameras take a picture every 30 minutes of the front of Jakobshavn Glacier. Scientists use this data to monitor and to record the rapid changes that are occurring as a result of a warmer global temperature. And we spent the night camping on a ledge of ice overlooking this glacier, and all we could hear was the eerie cracking noise as large chunks of ice carved off the front and crashed into the water below. We also helped install and download the data from scientific monitoring stations out on the Greenland ice sheet. This experiment has been running for more than 20 years, and during that time, it has measured more than 140 feet of melt. To give you a sense of scale, that is the equivalent height of 10 double-decker buses. After Greenland, we traveled to London, where we joined the London Climate March. We filmed it, and we did this all in the run-up to the UN Paris Climate Conference. We cut the entire film together, and we shared it onto the blog that my brother and I run, and we were mind-blown by the experience. Over a million young people watched it within the first three months of it going online. It turned out the internet was a mountain to shout from. In fact, it was better. It gave us a platform to connect with a global audience and to start a conversation around something that mattered. The second action is to organize, because when we unite under one goal, we significantly increase our chances of achieving it. We all have a right to free speech and a right to peaceful protest, and we should use it. In fact, when you look back at the history of some of the greatest social movements, whether it is the fight for women's rights, abolitionism or anti-apartheid, some of their greatest victories were made when a critical mass took to the streets to peacefully demand change. In fact, the Women's March that happened at the beginning of this year is a great example of the power of demonstration. More than four million men, women and children took to the streets to peacefully demand change. And their voices ignited a global movement that is just getting started. And so encouraging your family or your friends to join you on local marches or rallies is a really great way to begin by organizing. Even Mr. Vice President Al Gore still makes it out to every march that he can. We can also interpret this action in other ways. Right now, as I speak, our world leaders are meeting in Germany for the 23rd UN Climate Conference to discuss their commitments to climate change. The last action is to lead, as in to lead by example. We all have the capacity in the approach that we take to our work and our day-to-day -day life to make a change that has a more positive impact on the environment around us. And this isn't a change that is a sacrifice. In fact, they can often have a more beneficial impact on our lives. As a group of students at Parsons School of Design, we were recently given the opportunity by the New York Department of Transport and by the school to replace two car parking spaces in the middle of Manhattan with a temporary public seating structure. And so we started this project by asking ourselves what it would look like to take a more sustainable approach to building it. And after diving into a bunch of research and a lot of back and forth, we designed and built a 40-foot structure made from 360 pieces of bamboo. 
Bamboo is an incredibly strong organic material. When it grows, it sequesters carbon dioxide and it replaces it with roughly 30% more oxygen than an equivalent stand of hardwood trees. When it's used correctly, it has the tensile strength of steel and the compressive strength of concrete. In fact, in countries such as Vietnam, Indonesia, China and Japan, this plant has been used to make everything from homes to schools and even bridges. Yet in the US, despite the fact we can grow it here as a crop, we rarely see it. The frame of our structure has 75 plants which create a natural divide between the road and the sidewalk. Each plant hangs in a planter made from recycled plastic bottle fibers. Adding vegetation to our cities helps reduce a phenomena known as the urban heat island effect, and it helps absorb stormwater runoff, which often leads to the pollution of our local waterways. The result is a new space in the city that is open to everyone. This little section of road that was once dominated by two parked cars becomes a hub of social activity throughout the day. And at night, the solar panels that we mounted to the frame provide energy that light up the plants. We really wanted this space to start a conversation around alternative sources of energy and more sustainable methods of building. And to our amazement, despite it being a student-led project, it was featured on the front page of Design Boom and reviewed by the New York Times. Throughout this whole process, I have learned that creativity is a powerful tool for impact. You don't need expensive equipment, and you don't need to be a professional artist. We can use creativity through film and photography to better inform and to activate those around us. And we can use it through design to reframe complex problems and imagine new and exciting solutions to solving them. I've also learned that we all have the capacity to use our voice and start a conversation around something that matters. Find something that you are passionate about, something that you think deserves more attention, preferably the environment, and use your voice and the resources around you to educate, organize, and lead by example.